Hello and welcome to the Launch Pod, where we talk about brand building and solopreneurship. I'm very excited to be with you today because my guest is none other than Dennis Walsh. Now, Dennis is an interesting guy, has had a lot of lives, and I think it's fair to say wears a lot of hats. He is an IP attorney, he is a software engineer, and a car dealer. For now, uh, welcome to the show, and Dennis, also welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. Excited to be here. And especially after that introduction, uh, I've got a lot to live up to. Yeah. Well, you know what they say, right? Set the expectations as, as high as possible and then watch as everybody gets disappointed. Yeah, and then just watch a bunch of flailing. Yeah. So let's, uh, we'll start right. the flailing. <laughs> So you run, I, I didn't mention the name of your car dealership, but it's called Crosscut. And once upon a time, it was called Wheel Kinetics. Tell me about how you originally came to, uh, to start this business. Sure. The business uh, started back in college. I was uh, racing cars, as any 20-year-old wants to do. Um, it actually originally started back in the, uh, in the nineties, you know, people wonder, well, how'd you get money to race cars? Um, it was actually similar to today's world with the NFTs back then there was a dot com boom and my mom was nice enough to give me my $10,000 college fund because at that point she had had enough money to, um, pay for my college. Uh, and, and at that point college after over four years only cost $10,000, uh, you know, who knew? So she, uh, she gave me that. I somehow luckily put it all into America Online, um, which is some of your listeners probably don't know, um, was a uh, internet. It, was, it really was the internet for quite a while um, and then uh, slowly dialed away. But uh, back then it was, it was huge and the stock ran. And so I turned that money into quite a bit of money, um, cashed out of it, and then I had this money to start playing. So... Um, I had a bunch of friends. We started racing cars. And then lo and behold, you need a way to pay for that. And uh, I founded Wheel Kinetics as a business to buy and sell wheels for race cars. So that's how it started. Um, I was actually in physics class, and it all of a sudden dawned on me, well, wheels in motion, wheel wheel kinetics. And so it was just a nerdy, nerdy name um, that, that rolled from that. So uh, Wheel Kinetics started there, and then, of course, as any 20-year-old wants to do, you want to drive your race car on the street, but your race car won't pass emissions. So one of the ways I figured out to end run that was to start a car dealership, and then you can just put your dealership plate on, and then the car can drive wherever you want with your dealer plate. Uh, so that's what I did, and that's how the dealership started. Um, from there, my brother joined up. Uh, we, my family had been in the car business. My uncle had been in the car business, and my brother worked for him. Um, so those two had a parting of ways, and then he wanted to sell cars under my dealer's license. So I said, you know, sure, that's fine. I'm not, you know, doing anything with it other than, um, you know, and running the law. Uh, so he uh, right. he came in and uh, did that, and and that's how it got started. Wow. Okay. So already you were kind of familiarizing yourself with the uh, the law, I suppose, which. We'll get into uh, your background as an IP attorney a little bit later. I'm, I'm wondering, so this clearly was a while back, right? Oh, what, yeah. 20 years? Yes, yeah, God. yes. Uh, late yeah. 90s, early 2000s. Back then, I would imagine you weren't selling cars online, which is what you're doing right now. Um, when and I guess why did you decide to to bring your dealership online? So we actually were selling cars, interestingly enough. Um, it wasn't back in, in 2000, but 2003, 2004, 2005, uh, we really moved uh, heavily into eBay. Or My brother did, and then I helped him um, push those cars there. And obviously, when you're racing cars, you tend to be moving cars also. Um, so we, we were selling a lot um, on eBay, and that was kind of really 2005 to about 2010 and 11. That was eBay's heyday um, for selling cars sight unseen online. So uh, that was, yeah, we, we actually uh, were, were well ahead of the game back then. Wow, so you were already doing like sight unseen, not just advertising online, but actually selling the vehicles online. Yes, uh, eBay provided a really nice platform where you could upload whatever you wanted to, videos, pictures, describe the vehicle how you wanted to. And then most people on eBay already came in with the expectation of, I'm gonna buy something online. Um, so unlike the uh, current ways that you find cars, generally, you know, Auto Trader in the U.S. or um, uh, Car Gurus, one of those, 
um, people are expecting a more local experience. But when people enter in through eBay, they're looking for an online experience. So there wasn't uh, the friction that you'd kind of anticipate um, mm. that that you know might be present even back then. Wow. It's unexpected. Well, you know, uh, interestingly, one of my uh, friends just, I don't know, maybe a year ago, he said, you know, if you were to travel back in time 20 years and when you started this and say, what are you most surprised of today? Um, you know, how would you answer that? And I said, you know, in 2005 and six, obviously, there was a lot of, of friction to selling a car sight unseen. And I am shocked that there is still as much friction today as there is back then. If you were to put me in a time machine back to 2005, six, and say in 2022, how much friction will there be to buying a car online? I'd say, oh, hardly any at all. People will be used to this and we'll be doing it. And frankly, I'm not sure it's subsided at all. I think that I'm still trying to overcome almost the same hurdles um, from back then. So th that is definitely something that has surprised me in this journey. What kind of objections do you typically face when it comes to, oh no, I don't wanna, like what are people worried about? You kind of have to take this question, I think, in, in two phases. You know, what are they, what do they tell you they're worried about and what are they actually worried about? I Oftentimes, they're two different things. Mm. They're, they're generally not the same thing. They will tell you that they're worried, you know, that the car isn't, you know, what you say it is or that there, something's going to go wrong. They're kind of the, I forget the Peanuts character with the dark cloud that follows them around. Um, but yeah, that's kind of the image you get of them. They're just kind of the sad Sally that whatever happens wrong is going to happen to them and it's just going to go badly. And so that's what they're worried about. Um, you know, so you're, you're, you're dealing with that up front, but I think behind the scenes, what's always going on is there's, there's a real trust breakdown. Um, mm. They'd want to say that I'm not sure that you're not a scumbag trying to take advantage of me, but they don't want to put that out there. They're trying to at least be polite about it. And so it's interesting because you have to tackle this trust issue and you can't tackle the trust issue by showing the car more. Because whatever you show right. with the car, they think you're George Lucas, you provide videos that are fake, you provide pictures that are fake, the inspections are fake, your reviews are fake, everything's fake. You're just a, you know, African scam artist you know, living out there trying to throw one over on them. Um, but they won't right. tell you that. They will say that there's still a problem with the car. So you really have to approach this as a, why am I trustworthy? Why is the business trustworthy? Why is the brand trustworthy? Why can you believe in us and what we're doing? So it's, I guess in some sense, it's not surprising because it's the old sale problem of, you know, you have to sell yourself, not your product. Um, but I think what makes this so difficult is the objections are couched in your product and rarely is it about your product. Interesting. Have you figured out how to overcome that? Trust you? <laughs> this is the proverbial, you know, multi-billion dollar question. Um, <laughs> for a long time, I was kicking myself that I, I felt like I hadn't figured this, how to overcome this quite as well. And in the U.S., there's a, a car dealer that's come along to try to do this called Carvana. And, you know, they're right. this massive force of nature now. Um, they started somewhat small. They were part of um, Drive Time, which was a, a major dealer. And then they uh, branched off into this Carvana. So they had a lot of funding and things going for them to start. Um, and they've really tried to tackle this space. And interestingly, I interviewed with them just to see if maybe there was a fit for us. And I talked to one of their heads of data um, and he was going through their objections. And their objections were, are you guys a scam? Is this a joke? And I thought, I can't believe this guy's saying this, Carvana. They have vending machines on the side of the road with cars eight stories tall. They you know, have millions of dollars into these stupid glass enclosures. And people still think this is a scam. If they can't get over this, I don't know what I'm going to do. Um, mm. So in a way, it, it tempered it a little bit and thought, you know, in some sense, this is an unsolvable problem, um, or at least maybe not unsolvable, but beyond my grasp for the time being. Um, and that I, I really have to focus now, instead of the blue ocean of, you know, every car buyer, realizing that I will not be able to convert every car buyer, that if they can't convert them, I can't convert them. Um, so it was really more of a focus then on I have to niche this thing down and go to people mm -hmm. um, you know that are already into this. Kind of like the eBay you know buyer. The eBay buyer, it was great because the eBay buyer self-selected. And unfortunately, eBay Motors kind of went by the wayside. Um, they, they really you know, squandered the golden goose, um, which hurt our business quite a bit. But it is finding those same customers uh, that are already predisposed to you know the trust issues. Um, I, I kind of, you know, joke tongue in cheek, you know, a lot of these people have these 
it's like the, the, the bad daddy issues, you know, where they, they've been abused in the past by something um, in retail and then they, you know, carry forward and blame me for it. So I need to find those buyers mm -hmm. that don't have that baggage. Um, eBay, it was great for that, but uh, recapturing that kind of magic is, uh, is something I'm trying to do. Right. Is that why you decided to build out your own platform? Was that like when eBay kind of declined or was there anything else that made you decide, you know, I'm, I'm a car dealer and, and, and I'm an IP attorney, but now let me also become a, a software engineer and let me build this crazy, sophisticated, you know, back end uh, to, to basically be able to accept offers and, and make counter offers and bring the entire deal process or the deal flow online. <laughs> it honestly started because I was just that cheap. Um, so it, yeah, <laughs> really? so, so we hadn't gotten into what, uh, how I got into law. Um, I'd always want to be an IP mm -hmm. attorney. I always wanted to go through that. Um, and so I remember distinctly in 2004, I was on the side of the road changing a battery and I'm out in Arizona, it's 110 degrees and my hands are burning and I'm just pissed off. And I said, you know what, this is it. Um, I'm too snotty, I'm going to law school. I, I can't handle any more of this. Um, <laughs> you know, so that's what I did. Um, fast forward then to 2010, um, law is terrible. Actually, law is great, I take that back. Law is great. The business of law is terrible. The billable hours, uh, you, you never mm. feel like you have time to do anything because you should always be at work. And I just, I couldn't handle it. And we kept the business going on the side. So I would post vehicles on eBay um, all through law school and while I was an attorney. Um, Roger kept, my brother kept buying cars. Um, so we kept this thing going. He, it was kind of a side deal for him too. And then I decided, well, let's just get into this and actually make it um, a real thing. So that's when I got out of the law. I, I quit my really fancy job in San Diego and you know doing great work for great companies and uh, came back to do this full time. So to answer your question, um, when I came back, we had three or four cars, not a big deal. Um, but as we started acquiring more cars, we couldn't keep them straight in our head anymore. And I started looking at the various software packages to manage your inventory. They call them DMSs or dealer management systems. And I didn't like any of them. And so in my undergrad, I was an electrical engineer. And arrogantly, electrical engineers, you know, we're just uh, smart software engineers. You know, you go into software engineer because you can't do math. <laughs> um, if you could do math, oh. you'd be a real engineer. So <laughs> uh, believe me, that ship sailed long ago. I am not that person. But anyway, that's how it started. Um, so I thought, well, I can hack this together. Mm -hmm. And I got involved, if, if we have any of the software people out there, this was a LAMP stack, um, PHP, MySQL. Uh, and I just started hacking away at it. I knew nothing. I knew nothing about databases. I knew nothing about software, nothing. And was just able to hack this thing together. So it started really as an inventory management. Um, and then it occurred to me, you know, I've got all this inventory already managed on this thing. Why can't I just throw up a front end um, website and bring more people to my website? It's just another avenue and another source. At that point, we were still all eBay. Um, so that's what I did and, and just put a front end to it. And then um, the offer system you alluded to earlier was based off the eBay offer system. I thought, well, uh, we do it on eBay successfully. Why don't we just do it on the website successfully? Um, so that got grafted on. And then, you know, over the years, it just kept growing um, from this, you know, relatively simple beginnings into this monstrosity that uh, crawls around the web today. Okay, there we go. So you are, what would you say? Your fiscal responsibility uh, led you down this path. That's a nice way to put it. Yeah, yeah. If, if, we're, if we're using euphemisms this morning, that's a good one. Yeah. I don't know how electrical engineering school works, but do you actually learn how to program there? Or was that something that you had to kind of figure out on your own? Very little. Um, so there's a programming uh, course or a programming avenue, and they call that computer engineering. And computer engineering is really mm -hmm. just electrical engineering with a few less electrical courses and a few more computer courses. Um, but in electrical, you will, I believe I, I, I think I only had one C class. Um, I, I, and that was it. So I had a little experience, um, into programming, but not much at all. Right. A lot of new frameworks and languages. Uh, pretty much up. everything. But right. uh, that said, uh, you know, the learning to learn, um, you know, was always part of it. And, and that's what, uh, engineering school and obviously law school really helped with. So picking these kind of concepts up, um, even though they're foreign and moving with them, um, I, I was well prepped for that.
you alluded to kind of niching down in in what ways have you done that is that a matter of selecting different types of vehicles to to market or is it um about the way that you kind of talk about the dealership and and the the whole process what goes into selecting for the types of customers or the types of prospects that would be yeah. a good fit for you because the the market the marketing channels um for cars tend to all still favor the uh in-person traditional um dealership your funnel has to start wide open um so in many ways you know you can't prevent the person from landing at your door so as they move through the funnel, you have to be able to eject them out of the funnel at some point, preferably before they contact you, because once they contact you, mm. um, they tend to want to run things how they want to run things and get very upset when things don't go the way they want it to go. You know, it's kind of, it's interesting. The, the customer that wants the in-person experience also wants to dictate the terms of the transaction and um, pound the table when things aren't, uh, when you don't jump through their hoops. The customer, the, the customer is always is, right. And, well, these is customers that... are always right. And believe me, they know it. And they will tell you all about how they're right. <laughs> um, so it is, as you said, it is about branding. It is about marketing. It's about trying to talk about your dealership. And quite frankly, it's about talking about your dealership and your cars in ways that make them uncomfortable. Um, so for instance, when Roger, uh, my brother, he does the videos of the cars where we show the test drives and he goes all over. And at the end of the video, he will say, uh, you know, what these customers don't want to hear, uh, which is, this is a used car, used cars break. This car is going to break. Um, generally, our cars are out of warranty. So, you know, we'll say Ford is a multi-billion dollar company with 100 years of know-how of how to make cars. They have MIT engineers and all this infrastructure. They built it. We didn't build it. And they will not stand behind their product. Their product is too old to stand behind because they don't know what's going to happen to it because it's going to break. We're just a couple guys out by a bunch of trailer parks in the middle of Tucson. We do not know what they don't know, and they know it's going to break. So we're telling you right now it's going to break. Don't have unreal expectations. If you want a new car, they sell them. They're $40,000 more. You can go pick them up, and then they'll break too because that's what they do. The difference is somebody else will pay for it. So we start with this very kind of tough love. Um, and that drives a lot of the customers, you know, that want that in-person experience, that want the glad handing, that want to be told sweet nothings out. And then it brings the people that are very, you know, real and go, yeah, you know, these guys, I, I know exactly what they're saying. Um, yeah, you know, you can't order a used car and you, there's nothing certain about what's happening and it's a risk and we're trying to mitigate risk. I get it. I get it. I'm in. I like it. Um, so it's it's very divisive, and it's definitely a divisive strategy that a lot of dealerships and I think businesses generally aren't willing to take. Um, but it's something that's worked well for us and has enabled us to, um, you know, keep keep a good reputation because you know we're selling diesel trucks that are sometimes 15, 20 years old with hundreds of thousands of miles. And if you don't set customer expectations, um, you know, you are in for it. That's interesting. The uh, the kind of polarizing approach, I would imagine that if you were to try a a different tack and, you, you know, try to sweet talk those those skeptics, what you would probably end up doing is just those people would never really come around. And anyway, and the people that are open to buying a car sight unseen, I would imagine they'd be put off by that kind of, you know, slick talking um you know trying to um to downplay the risks of buying a used car right because they know what's up and if they're not being i think that kind of person knows immediately when you're not that's very well said them. um yes that by by slick talking and doing more of the traditional route you will actually drive off you know your your ideal customer um, for that exact reason. Yeah, it's right. It's very much the other side of the coin. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with that more. So how come you sell diesel trucks, by the way? Uh, is, is that a conscious decision, like a, a strategic decision, or, or has it just kind of turned out that way by random? A chance? little bit of both. I, actually, the truck behind me is a gas truck. So, um, you know, we're, we're not we're not all diesels. Mm. Uh, it, there it's, you go. <laughs> most dealerships will find it, it actually it's a little bit like law. You know, a lot of people say, you know, well, you know, you're an environmental law attorney, you're a whatever attorney. You know, why'd you get into that? And in most cases, for most 
attorneys, it's really by accident. They were applying for jobs and their first job mm -hmm. just happened to land in this area and they rolled with it. And for cars, it was kind of the same thing. You know, we were trying to find our niche. We were trying to find what works for us and what we liked. And there's obviously, a, especially in the U.S., there's a real love and embracement or embracement. I, I'm picking, I'm picking silly words today. Embrace. Um, they are non-words. They, yeah, they, 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 you know, there's a there's a huge diesel truck community, right? The diesel truck communities, they they love these things, and um, it's something that people really talk about online. Um, so that that really got us into the into the diesels, um, and they they've worked out. Uh, worked out real well. So, you know, in, in the car business, you'd like to have niches. Um, so then those customers can come back to you. You know, if you have uh, Hyundai Santa Fe's and then a random BMW and a random truck, um, mm. that BMW owner probably won't come back to you again because it's not something you regularly carry. Um, and in used cars, it's hard enough to have something that somebody wants again anyway, um, even if you specialize in it, even if you have 50 of them. Um, you know, used car buyers obviously can be very finicky and all car buyers, everybody. Um, and it's not an indictment on car buyers. That's just mm -hmm. how it is. Um, and they may have a must have list, you know, 50 items long and you don't have that item, you're out. But if you can niche, obviously, then you have a better chance to have that. And when people have prior experience with you, sometimes they're willing to compromise on their on their list. So um, a little bit of accident, um, but I think old dealerships go through it um, and then they, they find out, uh, you know, what works for them. And, you know, some, some will end up, for instance, in the BMW niche or in the, you know, European car Volkswagens. Um, and then others will end up in the small SUV. Um, you'll have a bunch of, you know, RAV4s and, and commuter type cars and, and it just goes from there. Interesting. Do you get a lot of repeat customers? Uh, I would say, yeah, I should know this metric offhand. It's a little embarrassing that I... I'm waffling because uh, I don't know it off the top of my head. That's uh, right. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> uh, it, it's it's about thirty percent. It's about thirty percent. Yeah, we just wow. uh, actually just yesterday we had well we had a guy come that's in. Um, you know, he bought his third truck off us. He's a landscaper, uh, and uh, yeah, it's it's well. In, you know, when you've been in business for you know this many years, you know, there's a lot of customers rolling around. And actually, with that, I would I'm also including in that um, referrals. So referrals directly from customers. Um, it, it's about 30% versus, okay. you know, blue ocean people that show up, uh, you know, from advertising and work it that way that didn't have any kind of direct referral. So our, I would assume a lot of the repeat customers are kind of like B2B, you mentioned like a contractor. Quite or frequently. Like yeah. That. Um, although, you know, I'm or trying to think we've had four deals so far this month and two of them were repeat customers. Um, but uh, no, we've mm. we have we love the the general contractors, especially when you've got the diesel trucks. Uh, if you can find you know good niches with contractors and and business owners, and personally, I love dealing with business owners, obviously because there's a uh, a certain synergy there. Uh, but also they mm -hmm. um, they have their own ways of dealing with uh, with issues. Um, one of the big problems um, in selling diesel trucks to customers is they don't have a plan when it, when something goes wrong. And diesel is so specialized that there's a lot of predatory mechanics out there and mechanics that don't know what they're doing. And so something goes wrong and they just are thrown to the wolves. Um, you really need a plan with these things. And so mm. these businesses, obviously they have multiple ones. They either have in-house mechanics, they have shops. Um, so they're they're well equipped to, to handle whatever comes up. And then when something comes up, you know, with one of our cars that maybe we missed or something went wrong, it's very easy to work with them. Well, I seem to remember from the time when we worked together, and maybe you've figured this out now, but one of the things that we ran up against was, I believe it was financing options, right? And how to make that work. Maybe this is getting overly technical, and if so, we can just cut it out. But dealing with basically different all of these different institutions, but then also these different states, right? And um, given that you you sell cars online, you get clients or customers from out of state. I, I guess is, is I don't know what I'm asking here, um, but are there any issues like that that you've found that are perhaps unique to running an online car dealership as opposed to 
running like a brick and mortar business? Not, it's interesting, not necessarily. So everyone, all, when I say everyone, all of the car dealers have this issue. Um, because even the ones that don't, uh, you know, sell online are still selling cars out of state. Um, you know, inevitably the, the dealer that, you know, has all Ford Tauruses that nobody, you know, in his neighborhood wants, much less in the next state wants, um, will stumble across some sort of more specialty car that demands out of state attention, um, you know, and, and isn't that common locally, and, and they'll be looking out. So everybody has some experience um, selling sight unseen. That's, and, and that was true back in the seventies. You know, right? I, you know, you had to move to where the cars were, and if there was a, uh, you know, a nice '66 Corvette in the neighboring state, you know, sometimes you flew out, and sometimes you just talked to the guy on the phone. And if you trust him on the phone, you'd buy it. Um, so this has always kind of been a feature of of the car dealer, um, and something that other dealers have to deal with. Now we just have to deal with it at a, diff a different scale than a lot of these others. Um, so it's difficult for us then um, when there are financing considerations to to work with that because obviously some lenders, um, they're licensed in some states. And then obviously if a vehicle goes to, you know, I don't, a neighboring state, they may not have the resources or licensing available to go deal with that. You know, if they need to repossess a car in a different state, um, they may not have that set up. And so uh, the lenders tend to be um, a little more guarded in, in that respect. And so you would think the national banks, you know, the here in the U.S., Wells Fargo or Chases of the World um, would be real amenable to this. But it tends to uh, be actually the credit unions and uh, some of the national um, financing groups like Westlake are uh, are more interested in doing that. But it's it's always a consideration. And, um, and, and also, too, um, for us, a lot of the lenders will require us to perfect the lien in that state. And I'm in Arizona. Obviously, I know nothing about Colorado DMV. I know nothing about Kansas DMV. So every time one of these customers comes up, now I get to get an education I never wanted in Mississippi DMV law and how to send a title out to them and get it to work. And I have to babysit this thing. So a lot of times um, I'll just say, you know, the overhead that is required to make this thing work, I can't do it. I, it financially, it just doesn't, time-wise, it just doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. um, so at that point, we'll require the customer to come in um, either as a cash deal or provide their own financing, um, which oftentimes is, is just easier for everybody. Switching gears a little bit. What, what, was, was that a pun, John? I know the... <laughs> well, Clever. it wasn't intended to be, but... Um, Go ahead. You know, so the pandemic has been interesting, let's say, to a lot of people, but I think when I look at my own clients and, and the people in, in my general network, <clears throat> I think you stand out as somebody that has really like gotten the brunt of it um, in, in terms of you know, instability, uncertainty, and, and just facing a lot of, a lot of problems, some, you know, related to the pandemic, some I know not related to the pandemic. How are things now? Do you feel like you've, you've kind of recovered if, if that makes sense? Or like, are you back to a state of normalcy or is, is it still like all even worse? Air? I think that this is the scariest time. Um, so no, we, we've definitely taken the brunt of it. Um, the, obviously we've been doing this now for, for 20 years and my family, our extended family has been doing this since the sixties. So, you know, we have a large body of knowledge here in the car world and markets have never been like this, uh, not even remotely close. Um, if you take a look at the, so if you follow me on my, um, Twitter account, uh, La Jolla, if you're interested, L A W J O L L A. Um, I post a lot about the used car market and what's happening to the values. And it has gone up, uh, I believe it was 150% for the median used car over the past year and a half. And, you know, these are depreciating assets. And in many cases, they're outgaining um, stock markets, even cryptocurrency. Um, it's just completely absurd. So as a business, we had a choice, and, and all the dealerships have a choice, of you can continue to buy into this um, with these appreciating used cars. And then 
worry about what happens when the inevitable bubble comes. You know, people talk themselves out of bubbles, um, even on appreciating assets like houses and stocks and all that. When there's a depreciating asset that's bubbling, I, I've never seen one. I'm sure there's examples. I've never seen it. Um, you know that the reckoning is going to be quite something. And so we were left with the choice of, do you want to have a lot full of overpriced vehicles that you're then sitting on when the reckoning comes? Um, or do you want to just try to stay small, hit singles, um, and just kind of be the uh, the proverbial uh, you know mole waiting for the asteroid, uh, and you'll come out after the destruction ends? Mm. And and that that's the route that we've taken. So um, in some sense, we were um, I don't want to say fortunate, but um, through some things outside of our control, our workforce um, trimmed itself. And so we ended up, um, we had um, myself, my brother, and three others. And now it's just down to my brother and I. Um, and so we thought, well, you know, we can go get a bunch of cars. We can bring more people in. We can get mechanics back in. Um, and we just decided against it. We said, you know, these other dealers, they have high burn rates. They've got to keep buying into this or they have no business. Or they can lay everybody off. I guess they can go that route. Um, but most of them have just chosen to just keep firing. And I thought, you know, we don't have to bet the business. They're betting everything. And we don't have to do that. But it does mean that we just have to stay the small kind of contracted mole, um, you know, waiting for the rest of it to, to kind of shake out. And I think what's going to happen for our industry, which in some ways is even worse, is we're not going to see the asteroid day of reckoning. Instead, we're going to see years of decline. And what that's going to look like for us is essentially a car hot potato of, you know, you buy a car one month, and if you have it the next month, you're in trouble. Uh, you've got to unload these things, and you've got to unload them fast. And in mm -hmm. fact, we're already seeing it now. Um, March was the second decline in used car value, and it's the first time we've seen two months of decline um, since, I think it was February or, or January of 2020. Um, and, and given that the uh, new cars wow. now are starting to pick up just slightly, um, and it looks like the market was saturated with everybody that was going to buy a car has bought a car and the rest that are sitting on the sideline know that they're overpriced and are willing to sit a little longer. Um, it looks like we'll start seeing this kind of gradual um, decline where I'm looking at years of just seeing this accelerated depreciation in the car. So, um, yeah, it's something that uh, it worries me greatly. Mm. <laughs> we think about, about quitting, quitting all the time. Um you know, yeah, absolutely. And <laughs> what always brings us back, and I know it's what brings me back and it's what brings my brother back, is that we really like doing this. Um, I like every business, you know, there are your struggles and there's the days you pull your hair out. And there's the days that you just turn tables over. Uh, but, you know, by and large, we like coming to work. We like showing up. We like the cars. We like the business. We like the people. Um, we like all of it. And so... Um, you know, to leave that all behind um, is tough. And, you know, financially, you have to make choices that, uh, you know, may mean that the fund's over. Um, but thus far, you know, we've we've managed to maintain the finances and, and keep it going. Um, clearly, you know, I could do things that make more money. I was um, reminiscing the other day that had I stayed in law, I would have been, I should have been a partner by now and would have been making, you know, fantastic sums of money. Mm. Um I'd probably also be an alcoholic and maybe other things would have happened too. Uh, but uh, uh, financially, I'd be far, 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 far better off than I am now. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm enjoying my time. I'm enjoying my time on this podcast. If I was doing this podcast as an attorney, I'd go, you know, are we finished yet? I got to get back to work. I got billing. I've got hours to make. Um, and instead, I'm able to sit here and enjoy talking. So um, there's always that work-life balance. And I think in this um, you know, even though you, you consider quitting because the finances get so hard and you know that you could be doing things um, better for or, or doing other things for more money. Um, at the end of the day, you like what you do. And so you stick around. So again, uh, shifting gears this time, Pond definitely intended. I think it was back in 2019, right, yeah. that you and I worked together on rebranding what was then called Wheel Kinetics is now called Crosscut. And of course, the you know, the renaming of it was was part of that process. I find that a lot of times, you know, you know, people get stuck with brand names that maybe they're not, you know, entirely satisfied with or happy with or proud of. 
and um, they might have other problems too, you know, SEO problems or problems of just kind of uh, being intelligible to people or, or being easy to spell or pronounce or what have you, right? There's a, you know, not maybe not a hundred reasons that a name might be bad, but it's definitely up there. Um, first and foremost, what was the general process like? And was there anything, I guess, unexpected or, or anything that you learned that you didn't expect to In the rebrand learn? process? Yeah, that's right. In the rebrand process. I, I was really stunned at how difficult it was um, to select another name, uh, especially because I, I think of myself as, as open-minded and, and ready to go with the flow. And, um, you know, I, I don't know if you changed a lot of your procedure based on, you know, how stuck in the mud we got, uh, <laughs> which, you know, I, I blame a lot on, on me. Um, but that was a really, really surprising. And, and, you know, you kept giving the, the salient advice that, you know, whatever name we select is better than what you have now. And we really can't let, you know, perfection be the enemy of good. And if you look at businesses, and I think this is where business owners really get wrapped around, here's another pun, wrapped around the axle. Uh, <laughs> and I certainly did, um, was you, the business name in some sense is one of the least important parts. And, you know, if you just look at other business names out there that are terrible, and they're killing it. <laughs> and right. it's not it's not so much about the name. And we always think it's about the name. It's really not about the name. You know, um, I sold, so uh, as John knows for our listeners, I had this really uh, nice uh, Nissan GTR a couple of months ago. Um, you know, 1500 horsepower is my race car. Um, and I just wasn't driving enough. It just sat in the garage. It was a giant garage queen. So I sold it. And I sold it to a guy um, who's a car dealer um, from Phoenix, and he owned this place called Phoenix Legit Motors, Motorsports. And they're killing it. I can't believe how well they're doing. They're just absolutely crushing it. And in my opinion, he has the worst name I have ever heard, uh, Phoenix Legit Motorsports. I couldn't come up with a worse name if I tried. And, and he's crushing it. And it was just an example of, you know, that I really let myself, I think, get hung up on the process of naming um, for some kind of weird perfection um, when you just have to, you know, figure out something good as, as we went through, figure out something that people can spell, people that something, you know, that it doesn't have hidden meaning. Um, that was the problem with wheel kinetics. Everyone looked at me and went, huh, what? How do you spell that? What does that mean? Uh, and so no one got it. It was insider meaning because it's a nerd term, um, you know, describing the, it's a physics word for motion. And nobody could spell it. No one could spell it. And so everybody would remember my company as wheel something and they just <laughs> hack some Google search in and hope that they ended up there. Um, so, so long as it's memorable and it's easy to spell and to the point, you've got your name, go with it and, and roll. Um, so, so yeah, that was surprising to me. Well said. I, I don't think I could have put it better if, even if I tried. So yeah, I, I think a lot of the time what what i see is business owners kind of treating the name of their business the way that they would treat you know the like naming their their child or something like that right your your unborn child and you're trying to you know figure out oh well should we name him john or should we name him dennis or or felix or or what have you and it's this nerve-wracking decision because that name is going to be stuck with him for for the rest of his life and to some extent i think is is probably going to like shape his his personality you know just hearing um a, a certain name all the time i i think uh sort of does probably something to your <laughs> to your brain um but yeah it's really not as big of a deal as that when it comes to your business because as you know now you, you can always change it if if you do run into issues right um and if you do wisen up after after a while um but also as, as like you said as long as it doesn't have any major problems your name is probably going to serve you just fine right 
And I think that is especially true if you've got like a brick and mortar business or, or one where, you know, the, the branding of it maybe isn't quite as important, right? Like you mentioned, uh, legit motorsports, which actually, you know, maybe isn't a terrible name. Um, it's kind of goofy, right? But uh, you could certainly uh, you could certainly think of worse, like wheel kinetics. Well, so uh, to go back to your earlier point, the, the name you should pick is Dennis, just for the record. <laughs> um, but for you're right, you're right on a on a technical branding point. You know that. Actually, Phoenix Legit Motorsports satisfies our our issues of being memorable. Um, it satisfies the uh, you know easy to spell, easy to say. Um, where I'm saying that it's it's a poor name is I, I always feel like you know anytime you say what you are, that's what you're not. And mm -hmm. so when you have to tell people you are Phoenix Legit, um, first off, it's such slang that you know when I picture when I walk into Phoenix Legit Motorsports, who's going to be standing there? Um, it isn't exactly the people I want to do business with. Right. Uh, so it's got some bad connotations there. You know, we're saying we're legit, you know, hint, hint, you're not. Um, you know, like if you want to say I, I'm, I'm trustworthy cars, well, you're not trustworthy. Um, so, so that's where I, I kind of bash it. Um, but nonetheless, uh, it hasn't slowed them down a bit. I mean, maybe it has, maybe it's not optimal. And, and had they picked a different name, they'd be killing it even more. But mm. um, clearly they're all eating over there. Um, so it, it hasn't hampered their their progress to any measurable degree. Right. After we had finally, you know, settled on on Crosscut, did you run into any problems or was there a lot of like customer confusion around it? Because that's something that I think a lot of business owners get tripped up on. And, you know, that's, I, I think the biggest stumbling block that prevents people from actually going through with a you know, rename or like a proper rebrand, right? Yeah, there, there certainly was, um, you know, it's, it's never, you know, it's not smooth, smooth sailing. Um, but I think people or business owners, especially think that it's going to be this insurmountable, um, mountain and it's not, you know, you set up your, uh, your redirects, you know, through Google, um, you know, well, through your, um, your DNS provider, um, so that when people type in your old website name, they end up at your new website. And what I did uh, was actually I put in a uh, little query parameter into my redirect. So when people end up at my new site, um, the query parameter triggers that it came from the old site. And then they see a banner that says Wheel Kinetics is now crosscut. And then I link to the blog article explaining our whole uh, rebrand and why we did it. So when my old customers come through or if they're finding you know old Google results or whatever, then they can you know come up to speed on you know the rebrand. And then if they're curious why we rebranded, you know we wrote a blog on it, or I wrote a blog on it that's been tremendously well received. People have really enjoyed the behind the scenes process, and I've gotten a ton of uh, really positive comments about that. Um, there's some customers that are confused. You know why did you do that? Um, you know I like the old name, and everybody's got an opinion, especially when it comes to you know what your name is. But interestingly, nobody has an opinion on the things that actually matter. You know, what is your brand tone? What is your uh, your visual layout? What is you know? What are the things that communicate your values? What are your values? Nobody will tell you anything about those because it goes right over their head. They just want to stick on the name. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's when you say, you know, that that really, when people raise you know their minor objections to your name change, it's not that big of a deal. They just they like familiarity. People like familiarity. And when you change it up on them, sometimes they get a little resistant. Um, but at the same time, you're also going to hear a bunch of good things. Um, actually, one of my first, um, uh, right after I rebranded, I spoke to a uh, uh, guy who makes uh, uh, merchandise, Woo. Uh, a merchandise guy uh, locally. And he said, okay, yeah, Crosscut, and he's taking my stuff down. And uh, finally, it came up that we were wheel kinetics. And he goes, mm. oh, you're wheel kinetics? Yeah. Oh, I sent all kinds of people over to you, but I never knew how to say your name or where to send them. And I love the new name. That's so much easier. <laughs> so there you go. You know, you'll you'll you also be completely validated, uh, you know, by by others. Um, I think if if we were to get into what's actually been difficult, the difficult part um, has been the the legal part, and, and that's me as an attorney. Um, I actually I take that back. It's not the legal part. It's the procedural part with your business partners. Um, 
So for instance, I had to go file with the Arizona Motor Vehicle Department and tell them that we're the same corporate entity. So corporate wise, we're still wheel kinetics, but I set up a DBA with the Secretary of State and then I had to file that with the um, DMV. So they took it and, and that's fine. But then somehow the auction companies are running some sort of database in the background. And then they come up and then they find it's Crosscut, even though I didn't tell them to put the titles in Crosscut's name. So mm -hmm. then Crosscut's written on our titles and then we take the titles in, but then Motor Vehicles hasn't updated it on their end to the providers here to say Crosscut. And so it, it kind of got into a mess that we're still dealing with and trying to sort the titles uh, with DMV and make everything um, easy and, and streamlined. So. I think a lot of times if you've got, uh, you know, those sorts of issues, banking issues, um, that is where the, mul the the bulk of your time is actually going to be spent. A, a, a like... lot of it, though, not to cut you off, but a lot of it is yeah. is really because we're in such a regulated um, industry. If if you were a, a software SaaS company, uh, I, I don't think you would have any issue. Um, but when you're in an industry where you have so many government layers um, and other large business players that rely on those government layers, it can be a little more uh, work. Right. Yeah. I was going to say it, it sounds like that's very much a, uh, a, a problem that you might run into in certain specific industries, but not universal. But I, I do want to ask you about the, um, some of the more universal problems around, you know, um, rebranding perhaps, but also more generally just, trademarking and, and intellectual property law, because I, I think that's one of those things that a lot of solopreneurs or small business owners kind of avoid thinking about or, or getting into because it seems very complicated. It seems very, um, very expensive, right? Is there, is, I guess, first and foremost, is, is that a mistake? For them to avoid the area completely? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. It's, I, I guess if, if you'd like me to give a quick primer, I, I think the listeners, you know, might find it uh, uh, good to just get a quick survey of intellectual property and, and how it works you know, in, in two or three minutes. Would that be yeah, something please. to go into? So uh, I don't like to get people into the legal weeds because, you know, that's an attorney's job. And, and as a business guy, a business person, you know, you don't need to know that. Um, but it's helpful to at least know the 200,000 foot view of how the different IP regimes work. Um, because then when you're trying to Google it um, and you're confused that, you know, your copyright protection and you're ending up in trademark stuff and all of a sudden nothing's jiving and you don't quite understand what's happening. Um, so real quickly, there's three, well, there's a couple more, but basically there's three intellectual property legal regimes. That's copyright patents and trademarks. Copyright covers anything that is creative. Um, so they call it you know, any kind of creative expression. One of the uh, law school cases on this was somebody tried to uh, copyright the phone book. <laughs> and as you can imagine, uh, it'd be, especially in the old days, it'd be very advantageous to copyright the phone book because you did all of this work to go out and get everybody's phone numbers and addresses. And then somebody just comes off and knocks you off and shrugs your shoulders. And the court said, actually, that was allowed. You could go in there and knock off the phone book because the phone book was just a set of facts. There was nothing creative about it. There was no human expression in displaying the facts. Now, they went into how the facts were arranged. And they said, even though it was just, uh, it was a uh, alphabetizing order. And they said, that is not enough. They said, if you had some more interesting order, and they said, you know, the, the hint was it could be just a little bit more, just a little more something, then we could give you some sort of copyright protection on this. But you're not copywriting the facts. And so when you're looking at copyright, you're looking at what is the creative expression. And there's many layers. When you get into a website, for instance, you know, there's the copyright that will be on the text of the website. There's the copyright that's on the overall look. There's the copyright on the button. Um, in songs, there's copyrights on the uh, actual performance of it. There's a copyright on the musical production. There's a copyright on, you know, so you get these layered approaches that are very difficult for people to understand and how they work in the interplay. And a lot of times you don't need to know that. Um, but you need to know that, that when you're in creative expression, then you're in copyrights, and copyrights have certain bundles of rights. Um, so reproduction, um, 
you can control that derivative works you know i can't go out and make terminator 5 uh that would be their derivative work um so things like that and and how that goes together um patents will go over any kind of ideas um methods um you know they call it inventions but you get a little bit more into it and it's really any kind of tangible idea you can't copyright an idea you can patent an idea and that requires going to the patent office and saying here's my patent uh, or here's my idea and you have to go through and approve it and you go back and forth to the patent office. That's different from a copyright. A copyright actually is uh, done as soon as it's what's called fixed in a tangible medium of expression. Essentially, as soon as you write it down, you've got a copyright. You do not need to go to the copyright office. Uh, you don't have to get an actual copyright. That's only to, to file a lawsuit or get statutory damages. Um, so a lot of solopreneurs think, oh, I don't have it copyrighted. I don't have a formal copyright. Not needed at all. The second you write it, it is copyrighted. Nothing else needs to happen. If you want to sue somebody, then there's more legal hoops you have to jump through, but you can do it retroactively, um, and it's not a barrier. So with copyright, you never have to think about what you need to do to protect it. It's already protected. Pants and your ideas. We had a joke in the IP world, um, in the law world, of if you tell somebody your idea without an NDA and you don't have a patent, you have just done a royalty-free tech transfer uh, because at that point, you really have no protection. Um, so, so patents are uh, they're very strong protection, but they take a lot of work. And uh, you know, if you're not willing to go through that process, just be very careful with what you tell people. Keep things a trade secret um, and on the, on the down low um, because that, that can, uh, well, once, once the cat's out of the bag, you can't get it back. Even if you file a patent, you can't get it back. You've already said it. It's already publicly disclosed. Um, there are some ways you round that, especially in the U.S., where you have one year from public disclosure. In most countries, um, once it's disclosed, it's out. You can't go back. In the U.S., you can, but it, it also creates problems. So, um, And then I know trademark, which is, which is one of the areas you want to focus on. Um, Trademark's interesting because it's actually one of the questions I get the most from my friends and business owners, you know, that know that I'm in business and know that I'm an attorney. And they say, well, you know, I've got this uh, business idea and I got this name, you know, how do I trademark it? And the interesting answer is you can federally trademark it and in other countries, you know, formally register it, however um, it's done um, in your jurisdiction. But you get certain use rights the second you put it into commerce. So for instance, I don't have a federal trademark on Crosscut. I have what we would call in the US a common law um, trademark. And in, in a place like where John is in Sweden, it would be a usage um, trademark. And it doesn't have the full bundle of rights that a formal, a formal um, national registration would have. So for instance, if somebody started a Crosscut dealership in Florida, I would have a little bit of an issue enforcing my trademark. Now, I've put my trademark into a national play, um, so they would have an issue there. I, 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 but if, if I'm not concerned nationally with enforcing something, your local uh, usage rights will do quite well with your trademark. Um, and then also, my usage um, would also prevent that Florida person from getting a national trademark, uh, or at least it should. So even if I tell the guy in Florida, you know, maybe you're allowed to have Crosscut Florida, but you'll never have national Crosscut Florida because I've preempted you. Um, a lot of times they'll change their name anyway. So um, mm. filing a national registration for a trademark, it's a good idea. You do get more protections. Um, it is helpful, but it's not the requirement, I think, that most solopreneurs think it is. Um, you really get a lot of protection just by putting it into use. Um, obviously, make sure that when you're using it, uh, that you are in the clear. Uh, you know, look at other businesses, and, and in some cases with trademarks, it's a little bit of a uh, a little bit of a dance, a little bit of uncertainty, uh, because there's different levels of trademark protection depending on how generic or specific your name is. If you have a very specific name, um, the classic law school example is Kinkos. Um, and uh, there are no more Kinkos anymore. They got bought up by FedEx. But uh, in the U.S., Kinkos was a, uh, a printing and mail store. And it was a completely made-up word. There is no word Kinkos. They mm. just made it up. And so if you tried to create a computer business named Kinkos, you would run afoul of their trademark. If you tried to create a, uh Apple harvesting business, uh, you know, a ranch named Kinkos, you would run afoul of their trademark. Because it's such a made-up word, they have huge protection in trademark. 
But then you look at something that's uh, taken out of industry. Uh, I'm sorry, a, a name that's taken into a different industry. The classic example is Apple Computer. Um, obviously, you can name your farm Apple Orchards. You can name your uh, furniture business Apple Furniture. Um, so they don't have a trademark on the word Apple. But if you're in the tech space, and obviously now increasing into the um, streaming space and media space and all that, um, you put Apple on because they've taken that word out of a traditional context and put it into a technical context, um, they will get pretty good protection in those fields. And then the most generic, uh, you know, when you call your computer repair business, computer repair business of Arizona, uh, you know, <laughs> you don't have much protection there at all, even when you have registered trademarks, um, simply because it's so generic uh, that there just there isn't much protection there. Very interesting. Um, so basically, to sum that up, you don't need to register a trademark in most cases, but doing so is, generally speaking, it seems advantageous. It's definitely advantageous, but it is not the barrier, I think, that most entrepreneurs will think that it is. Um, you know, most mm -hmm. people want to register a trademark before they even get started. That's what you need to do with a patent. That's not what you need to do with a trademark. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would okay. not advise that. Um, I would get it started. Um, and if, if you think that you need more protection or you're worried about it, um, definitely file. And, you know, in, in other countries, it's different. But in the U.S., it's fairly straightforward. Um, you go to the, the trademark office um, online, the patent and trademark office, do a search, see if there's anybody in your area. Um, they've got different classifications. So they'll call it, you know, whatever your business is in group 45, group 32. If you can't figure out what group you're in, look at big players in your space and pull their trademark up and look at how they're registered and they'll show you what classes they're in and then go search those classes and see if there's anybody that's anywhere close to yours. And you're looking for a live trademark. You'll see live and dead. Dead ones are ones that they've allowed to expire. Mm. Um, if you really want to be complete, go look and make sure those companies are no longer in business. If they're no longer in business, you're definitely in the clear. Um, and then, you know, file file a trademark, um, you know, for your uh, your name, your logo, all of that with the patent and trademark office yourself. You really don't need an attorney to do this. Um, the attorneys will tell you they will. Go figure. Uh, you know, it's it's in their business. Uh, obviously, that's what they do. You, you should get an attorney for patents. That's a different world. Um, you can really shoot mm -hmm. yourself in the foot there and waste a lot of your time um, making meaningless stuff. But with trademark, you will get 80% of the way there for zero cost. And uh, I, I think that's a good way to go go about it. It's, it's not that tough. Great advice. I guess a, uh, I, I actually have a selfish question if, if oh, that's yes. allowed here. Well, of course it's allowed. It's my show. What am I talking about? I recently bought a business. Um, the name of the business is, is Greco Gum. And it seems like we've got some issues with various copycats and, you know, people kind of, um, yeah, just trying to, uh, as, you, you know, with varying degrees of sophistication, um, what would you say? Um, Jack our style, is that the expression? No. Well, so as a good attorney, I must first issue all of my disclaimers, which is this is, you know, not legal advice. <laughs> I'm not representing you. And this is a generic question that is not actually about a specific mm. situation. So that said, of course, yes. um, it's it's a difficult question when somebody is taking your style. So going back to what we said, I'm glad we did the intellectual property primer. Um, when somebody's taking your style, mm -hmm. this is a copyright question. And uh, okay. clearly copyright builds on itself, right? Nobody has a copyright on the letter T. Nobody has a copyright on the word the. But I wish I could quote Shakespeare off my head and sound very smart. Um, but if I wrote, you know, a famous line of Shakespeare. Now, Shakespeare doesn't have a copyright because it's 70 years past William Shakespeare's death. So there's no more copyright. But if he had just written that you know, he would have probably a copyright on that sentence because that sentence would be so unique hmm. that using that. So there's levels of abstractions with copyright that, that are fact-based matters that are a lot of times hard to parse. And, you know, as, as an attorney, I tell the client, you know, we're going to get in front of a judge or a jury, and who knows? I mean, this is a tough call, whether or not this is going to be protected or if they're going to say, this is the equivalent of trying to copyright the word the, not happening. You know, do hmm. you have 
it's a little bit like the phone book. Do you have sufficient, sufficient excuse me, um, expression that this is going to be legally protected? So when they're, when they're jacking your style, how distinctive is your style? And, you know, is your style, you know, like so distinctive that it's really going to give you, um, you know, a copyright. We can get into, you know, what the actual legal factors are. Um, but they are factors. Mm. They're not elements. And in law, there's, there's a difference. So, you know, elements are you just kind of run through them and check yes or no. You know, factors are we just take, you know, a bunch of facts. We have a bunch of factors. We shake them up and see what comes out. Um, so you tend to get just results when you do that, but you don't have great predictability. Um, so you just have arguments and you're just making arguments and you're trying to do it. Right. Um, so to answer the question, it really depends on how closely they've jacked your style and how jacked your style is. Um, it, it, you know, if you've got a really distinctive style, you're gonna have more protection on it because it's more creative. If you know your style is very mm -hmm. plain, you're not gonna have, um, you know, for some of the tech people out there, you look at a website like Vercel, um, beautiful styling but they're mostly in typography their styling is mainly typography and spacing mm -hmm. they are not going to get much protection on this because if i put out a bunch of different Vercel copies and i just change the logo and change the text you probably wouldn't think that it was Vercel. you'd probably think it was somebody else but if we went to somebody i'm trying to think of a distinctive you know somebody using a distinct disco style in tech um that would probably get quite a bit more copyright protection so it, it, it's tough mm -hmm. um a lot of times you just say, uh, if now let me take a step back. If they are directly copying, this makes things much easier. If they are taking your images, if they are, you know, lifting your buttons, you can show a copying of the code directly. Um, direct copying mm -hmm. changes things dramatically. But if it's just improvising on your style, um, a lot of people know the stuff in the music business, um, you know, similar stuff where, you know, somebody will take a riff and improvise on the riff and, you know, did they steal the copyright? Did they not? It becomes a tough, tough question. But did they just take the riff? Did they just take this? Yeah, then it is. So if they're just taking what you're doing, wholesale copying, that's an easy question. Um, if they're looking similar and their marketing sounds similar and things are similar, a lot of times that's just business and that's just competition. You're saying there's a chance. You're saying there's a chance that I can... <laughs> Sue this guy. No, I'm just kidding. But um... <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I, unfortunately, this is this is the the ugly side of law that I don't like, which is, you know, the one with the deepest mm -hmm. pop, pocket books typically wins, and the one that wants to throw their weight around, right? Um, you know, will generally win this case, and they generally win trademarks. Um, mm. uh, so, yeah, uh, you know, if you, if you want to throw your weight around, you know, you probably can get them to change, especially if there's colorable arguments an attorney can make. Um, yeah. Right. But yeah, it, it, it seems like it's very difficult to kind of quantify and, and to set a certain definitive, um, I, I guess, threshold when it becomes illegal to copy somebody else and when it's, you know, kind of, it, it, I, I don't know, like creative license or something like that, right? Where you're just kind of, um, you know, being inspired by Absolutely. somebody else. Absolutely. And it's, it's tough, right? Because yeah. the law is trying to strike this balance between, you know, copying and taking somebody's ideas and improving upon ideas uh, and, and improving mm -hmm. upon ideas in a way that, that doesn't violate copyright. Um, you know, like I said, I, I can't go make Terminator 13, but can I make a movie about a cyborg that goes on a killing spree? Well, clearly. Can I call that person... Um, I was trying to think of what Linda Hamilton's character now in the Terminator is. Uh, I can't believe I don't remember her name. Anyway, could could I use her name in that cyborg killing movie? No, I couldn't. Right? I mean, that now that's running afoul of of their creative license. Could I use her name in a romantic comedy? Absolutely. So you know, there's a lot of considerations mm. that goes into it, um, and uh, you know, and the law tries to remain flexible, you know, to allow the you know building upon. Um, previous ideas, but in a way that, you know, tries to protect people, you know, where it's, where it's rational to do so. I, I think um, it's difficult for me as an attorney, I think, if I can do a quick aside to read a lot of these, uh, you know, the Twitter boards or, or Reddit or any of the stuff on the intellectual property, because you get these know-it-alls, uh, you know, they come in and say, I can't believe this is crap. You know, these, 
uh, in the patent world, it's awful because, oh, you get these non-practicing entities, these trolls, these patent trolls are ruining everything. And, you know, these people don't stop to think, you know, there's really smart people that have been working on this for hundreds of years. And this legal regime didn't just pop out of nowhere. It's because maybe there's some considerations you aren't thinking about. And I've responded back to some of these people. And I said, you know, these patent trolls, as we call them, you know, in the legal world, they're non-practicing entities. Now, they're ruining everything. I said, okay. Do you think that somebody, that an inventor in their garage that makes a patent for the next refrigerator, improvement on a refrigerator, should they have to compete against Samsung to sue them? Do they need a refrigerator company to sue them? Is that where we're at? That's what you want? They need to mm -hmm. practice making refrigerators to sue about refrigerators? Well, no. Okay. Well, but, you know, so why don't they just get Samsung to license it? Well, that would be great in a perfect world. That would be great if Samsung took them seriously. But generally, they don't take them seriously. You know who does take them seriously? Mm. Patent trolls. The patent troll companies take them seriously. So because Samsung won't take you right. seriously, these inventors will go sell their patents to the patent trolls. And then the patent trolls will go enforce them. So you create this mm. actually secondary market where these, these entities and holding groups will get these things to then go sue on. And you know they're awful and they're terrible people. And, and we can certainly have a reasonable argument about whether they've gone too far and whether that's sensible or not. But you know the idea that, that people haven't thought about this and that there isn't some value and that everyone's just stupid and that these people are smart and they see the light you know, and then they're going to go back you know, to scrolling TikTok is just wild to me. So anyway, that's my rant. I just had to get that off my chest. That, that there's been a lot of thought about this and it's certainly not perfect and we can keep having debates on where the lines are in copyright and patents and trademarks and all this stuff. Um, but, but the law here, um, it, it's really trying and going through this and being an intellectual property attorney, um, it, it, it really actually uh, emboldened my, my trust in the law that it's, it's trying to do the right thing, you know, imperfectly as it is. Right. Just trying to figure things out over time, which Reminds me of uh, your approach to yeah. social media. Let's talk about that for a while. Because I know you've got a lot to say about this, and it's something that you've been, I think, playing around with or, or focusing on ever since, really, since we did our rebrand back in 2019. And I know you've you've tried a lot of tactics a lot of strategies and it seems like you're kind of settling into a rhythm that kind of mm -hmm. works for you mm -hmm. right yeah the the social media um I, i'm i'm upset because i i always saw myself as being a trailblazer um and in the web space and mm -hmm. uh, you know in the application space you know we are um you know we are we are tech to the nines and, uh, you know, really doing stuff that even Carvana's not doing, you know, $100 million, well, billion dollar companies. Um, and I, I felt so, I, I'm so upset with myself that I missed the boat on social media and what it really is and what it can do for brands and, and people's, you know, communication with you and, and working back towards it. So I only really started taking brand building um, for my business and personally seriously about, eight or nine months ago. Um, so it, it has definitely been a journey, um, you know, that I'm starting and still figuring it out. Uh, but I would say that uh, I've certainly had some wins early on. Um, you know, is that something you wanted to get into? So, yeah, um, it, it was interesting. So starting on Instagram, uh, actually it was this, we uh, bring up our friends at Phoenix Legit Motors again. Um, one of the reasons that they are doing so well is their Instagram presence is incredible. I encourage you go check out and see what they're doing. Um, they have, uh, last I checked, they had 55,000 followers, uh, and you know, they're just going up daily. Uh, and, and all of the response that they get on there and all of the free media and all of the free attention, uh, was, was just amazing. And so that was what drove home to me. The, you know, I really need to do this. And so I started looking at what other people in the space are doing, you know, whenever you're in, doing social media, look at your niche, see what your niche is doing, uh, and then play to that. So I looked at what other dealerships were doing. And most of the other dealerships were very sad. <laughs> They're very sad accounts, low engagement, low volume. Um, but it, to the outsider, it kind of looks like they're doing the same thing that Phoenix Legit is doing. And it was hard initially to tease apart what the difference was. So I thought, well, I need a unique angle, right? We all need unique angles because we're awesome and we're cool. 
And, I, you know, it's just that that entrepreneurial myth that, you know, I'm so neat and I have to show everybody how neat I am. And so I thought, I'm going to come out and I'm going to show people uh, how to buy cars differently. I'm going to show them counterintuitive things, things that they're doing wrong. Um, and they're going to love it. They're going to love this, you know, take on how to beat the dealership. And as you find with most, most things in the entrepreneurial world, you're half correct. That is true. It was not a bad idea. It's still a good idea. But it is not going to get you the kind of growth that you want, especially for, or for me anyway, especially for how I was presenting it and what I was putting forth, you know, kind of with it. So I would create these carousels that said, that looked great. They're branded. You know, it followed our visual branding and our identity. And, and they're cool. Like, I, I go through them. I'm like, I still look at them. I'm like, this is neat. I like these things. Um, but they had a couple problems. One, Instagram no longer cares about pictures. They, it, it doesn't matter. You know, you want to put pictures on Instagram, you might as well just, you know, send them to your family because nobody's going to see them. Um, they're all about video. So that, that was a change that kind of blindsided me that hurt. Um, and I'm a car dealership and weirdly people want to see cars and guess what I have cars. So sometimes you, you trick yourself, I think in this, in, in, in this branding into doing things that um, really are, are a little bit against your brand and, and against what people want, you know, because I, I don't care about cars. I see them every day. I see the stupid thing every day. I wish this thing behind me would catch on fire, right? Um, I, I don't care. But there's plenty of people that want to see this car and show it to them. And that was the one thing that, that I saw like that Phoenix Legit was doing. They were posting really interesting, well-composed, um, you know, pictures of their inventory. They have a nice photo area with soft light and light boxes, and all the images were very appealing. And initially I thought, well, nobody wants to see your car. It's just your crappy car, eh? whatever. But that's my own problems coming out. I don't want to see crappy cars because I see crappy cars every day. These guys, they want to see cars. Mm. At the same time, though, you're trying to give the customers what they want, not what you want. So when you look at the other car dealers and what they're doing wrong, you will see, uh, I've got a car dealer, and actually, uh, I'll call him out by name just for fun. Um, so when, when John, when we do rebranding, uh, we look at what the competitors are doing. And one of our competitors is Cactus Auto Sales, and they're just down the road. And they do a mm. tremendous job of selling vehicles in person. They're your traditional dealer. They're family-owned. They've been there for a trillion years. And uh, their word of mouth is great. They, customers have really great experiences there. And you go into their social media, and it's just a sad account. They've got 400 or 500 followers. They've been there for a million years, and they make posts almost daily. And nobody follows them, and nobody cares. And you look at their content, and their content is almost always, look at this person that just bought a car from us. And there's people out there on video, and they're ringing mm. the bell, and, oh, look at this, people buying. That, nobody cares. Nobody, because that's about you. That's about you, the business. That's about you, the entrepreneur. That's right. about you, the dealership. Nobody cares about you. They care about themselves. And when you're sitting there beating your chest, showing how great you are, also at social media, you're at the top of the funnel. You know, you are trying to cast a wide net um, and give people, you know, what they want. They're not, a, you're not about to close them. That's not a good thing to show, you know, is everybody ringing the bell at closing when people are just about to make that buy button. That might be a good thing to show them then. But you are at the top of the funnel and you are showing them this crap that is just about you. And that's why it doesn't work. And so kind of coming to that realization and then making content um, on, that, on that kind of vein. So um, more to your direct question. I'm sorry that I've gone into a 15-minute tangent that hopefully people found interesting. But I think um, they will. Well, hopefully. Um, so what, what I found is then is looking at other car dealers that have, uh, you know, uh, beyond Phoenix Legit, um, that are going into videos and how they're doing it. And you keep coming across as an entrepreneur across the same stupid theme, and that's storytelling. It's storytelling, a storytelling, a storytelling. I don't find my cars, again, interesting. But a lot of people, when you tell a story about how you bought this car at auction, and then how you reconditioned it, and then how this customer came in and they were great, or they were terrible, and then they bought it, and then the car left, but then you, whatever, it's a story. And people find stories captivating, even if you don't. And so now that I've started doing some reels and storytelling, um, and some of the and some controversial storytelling, um, they've really hit. Um, I've got a couple now that are over a hundred thousand views, and 
you know, making that kind of, uh, you know, commitment to story, you know, and it can be educational too. I mean, obviously educational storytelling, but, but, you know, think about your business and how to tell the story and stories that you may not necessarily find interesting, but other people might play with it. Um, cause some will fall flat. There's no doubt. I've had plenty fall flat, hmm. uh, but going through and, and really trying to tell your story. For instance, I've got a, uh, this really interesting BMW M4 that I bought at a salvage sale that uh, it was a theft recovered vehicle and the auction didn't tell me that it had been in a gunfight. And so this car shows up having been in a gunfight. But what was great about this thing is I was anticipating wow. that there was gonna be some kind of story with this car. So I actually showed video of us, uh, my brother and I talking about this car before we bought it. And then I showed the auction. I've got video of the auction. I have video of it showing up on the transport. And now I'm doing videos of reconditioning it and how we're getting it together. And actually, I just showed John, you know, I've got this bullet here that came out of the car. So this car has all kinds of stories to tell. I've posted a few of the stories up on Instagram um, and uh, Facebook just to see how, how they'd fly in, in short form. And people love it. I've, in fact, just yesterday, I was at a, uh, my repair shop. And one of my friends that is just kind of a friend, I sort of know him, uh, he happened to be there. And uh, I was asking about his car and he said, hey, I'm watching all your Instagram stuff. What about this BMW you have? That's crazy. Like, I didn't know this guy was following. I had no idea. And I run into that at the gym, um, at uh, the detail shop, other people I have no idea you know, know about what I'm doing because I'm posting this stuff and, and it's engaging with them. So uh, yeah, mm -hmm. it, it's... To me, it's it's find your storytelling niche, I think. If I were to say anything about how to get your business social media going right, it's experiment, play with it, and, and find that storytelling niche because um, when you start getting that and you start resonating with those customers, um, it's really powerful. And you'll have your friends coming back you know, to tell you that, uh, that they're interested in it too. Right, well, who wouldn't be with, uh, with bullet holes and That's right, it's, it's, crazy, it's, like, uh... it's like real life Fast and the Furious. <laughs> Shootouts, yeah. By the way, that that story is in and of itself nuts. The uh, the BMW. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. So out. so if you want to follow us on Instagram, um, it's by Crosscut, <laughs> and you can uh, you can come. Uh, yeah, link in the description. Yeah, you can come follow. Link us in and, the uh, description. Uh, you see, I, th but this will actually be more of a long form <laughs> video. So my uh, I, I want to put some of these out now on YouTube and um, uh, you know get some of mm. our more long form content uh, you know there, but. Uh, Instagram and Twitter are, are great ways to just post short form, you know, selfie type stuff and see if it flies. Um, see if posting it on something like YouTube is even worthwhile. Mm -hmm. um, so you can build up uh, without taking the big time commitment plunge. Right. Yeah. Because if something doesn't get, I think at this point, really, you know, tens of thousands or, or even hundreds of thousands of views on Instagram, chances are it's not going to be getting much traction on YouTube. I mean, it could if it's you know, sort of evergreen, more search engine optimized content. But it's gotten to a point now where the Instagram algorithm, certainly the TikTok algorithm, they are so good at finding a relevant audience for your content that if you are not able to go viral on, on those platforms, you should really be looking at the content rather than you know, the way that you distribute it and, and the way that you market it, because you don't need a huge following on Instagram, which is something I think that, you know, we've seen with Crosscut specifically, you know, you got videos on there that gained hundreds of thousands of views between them. And without really, I, I don't remember how many followers you had at that point, but it was... Mm -hmm. No, Certainly it's still not, not even in the actually. thousands. We're, we're at eight hundred right? and something now. Um, no, I think our right. first uh, hundred thousand video was with you know three or four hundred followers, and 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 make no mistake, you know if you're a entrepreneur out there, you know who's, who's getting your account going, it is slow slog, it is not pleasant. Mm -hmm. um, you know, getting those first hundred followers was pulling teeth. Um, but the biggest thing that you you know just stay consistent, stay in it. Um, and, and I don't mean to be one of those people that take victory laps, you know, when they've got 800 followers, those people drive me crazy, you know, Hey, follow me. I know what I'm talking about. I've got 5,000 followers. You know, get out of here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so believe me when I I'm giving this out. advice, I am not saying I haven't figured it out far from it. I am saying though, what, what has at least worked for us and has gotten us over the hump, um, and is getting us, you know, customers, um, legitimate customers. I, I've gotten customers now from Instagram, 
um, you know, giving me tens of thousands of dollars. So, um, you know, from that standpoint, I feel confident at least giving some advice. Yeah, it's definitely it's a, it's a tough slot, and and for sure avoid avoid doing the shady stuff. Don't buy your followers because one of the things you know John was just talking about the the Instagram algorithm. One of the things the Instagram algorithm does is it sees who interacts with your content initially. You know, their time watching it, their time interacting, are they liking it, are they saving it, what are they doing? And they will just show it to a small subset. And if those small subset doesn't interact with it, it's dead. It will be buried, never to be seen from again. Mm -hmm. So ideally, you would like very interactive people. And a lot of it, too, you know, with a business is being, and a lot of people don't think about this part either, it's being social. It's actually interacting with your accounts. It's going on to different accounts and liking their stuff and commenting on their stuff and trying to add value, you know, through some of those comments. Um, I've gone on to a lot of my dealer competitors, and when I see that they've posted a cool truck, I share it on mine. Um, you know, and so now I've got these friends, you know, with these big, mm-hmm. you know, 30, 40, 50,000 accounts, um, you know, that will reshare my stuff because I went out and, and shared theirs. You know, it's just this reciprocal. And you, you want to help my customers, but you know, my customers want to see trucks. So when I see a cool truck, who cares if it's at a competitor's place? Here's a cool truck. Oh, cool. Right. You know, so my customers appreciate it. They mm-hmm. appreciate it. And, you know, so you don't want to also think that you're a business, you know, in isolation throwing content, you know, try to be a part of it too. I realize it, especially as, an, as a solo entrepreneur, you know, how do you divide your time? I mean, we could have, you know, a 10 hour podcast on this question and still not scratch the surface. It's an incredibly hard thing to weigh. <laughs> um, but I would say, you know, when you're in bed at night and you can't sleep or going through something, scroll your stupid feed. It's worth it to get some of those comments out, get some of that interaction coming uh, and, and bring people through um, because it, it will in the long run pay dividends. Um, And then the other big thing I would say too, try to move people to an email list, try to figure out a way to have an email list because one of the big problems with social media is you are at the whim of Instagram and they can shut you off tomorrow. They can change everything, but ultimately you own your email list. So I've had great success uh, having an email list that shows when my new inventory comes out and I advertise the crap out of it on Instagram and people have been very receptive to it. Um, I've gotten a lot of signups from it. So I've converted a lot of my Instagram customers then into my email list um, that I now own. So that's another uh, really mm-hmm. good thing to do with your social media. That's great advice. And I, I think it's something, especially that, you know, more traditional businesses overlook, right? Like I have a lot of clients that are influencers and, you know, content creators and that's their entire business. And I think in that space, there is a wider recognition that these platforms are not reliable, right? Like they're not, they don't exist to serve you, uh, Mr. Business Owner. They, they exist to serve themselves. And, you know, if you build a, a huge audience on one of these platforms, that can all be taken away from you in just a moment's notice. And even if you're not posting what you would consider to be, you know, content that might get you deplatformed, right? That's that's an entire conversation in, in its own right about, um, you know, what is going on right now with free speech on, on tech platforms. But even just thinking about, you know, the pages that were huge on Facebook a few years ago, I don't know, five, six, seven years ago and getting millions of views, you know, millions of likes. You look at where a lot of them are right now and they don't have any engagement anymore. And to the extent that they do, it's all paid, right? Because what happened with with Facebook was, you know, initially it was very easy to get organic engagement on Facebook, but you, you know, through this kind of, I think in, in many ways, um, you, you know, like negative feedback loop of Facebook changing the algorithm to promote more paid content because Facebook wants to make money. So they're going to show people, you know, the content of, of pages that pay them money. Um, and then, you, you know, I, I, I think that leads to lower engagement overall. You know, people aren't as interested anymore in the platform because they don't really get served the type of content that uh, really engages them, right? 
and it starts to feel very transactional. And then, you, you know, it's this kind of cycle where eventually you, you just, there's no way to grow an organic Facebook page anymore. A lot of those people, I mean, they, their entire businesses were just built around having a Facebook following and, you know, sending traffic from their Facebook page to their website uh, and, and to do a transaction. And there was no thought as to, okay, well, what can we do to actually try to own at least a, a slice of this audience that we've built, built up? And, and how can we, uh, you know, build a platform that is not vulnerable to the whims of the algorithm? And I think that is something, I mean, certainly, uh, you know this, Dennis, and, and a lot of my other clients know it. That's something I, I harp on all the time. I, I, I don't know. I, I think just, you know, business owners ignore it at I, their I, own peril. Absolutely. Right? Um, and, and it's funny touching on what you just said for Facebook. Um, so when, it, when we rebranded CrossCut, I did want to convert the Wheel Kinetics Facebook page because so many posts reference Wheel Kinetics. And I just thought it's not doing much for me anyway. I might as well have a new page and, and start fresh. Um, and then I started looking more because I hadn't really looked at the Facebook platform a whole lot, um, just threw the page up and kind of let it fly. And I came across exactly what you said, that there is no organic reach. Nobody will find your Facebook content, no one. Um, so I started researching a little bit more, you know, how do you get your Facebook content and, and how do you get it out there? And I came across this guy that mainly does Instagram and he gave his advice on Facebook was don't try to reach your customers on Facebook. There's no point. What you should do, he said, and you won't grow any followers either. And the problem is you won't look like a legitimate business because now you have no followers in a place that people think you should have followers because your content gets out, even though it doesn't. So he had a great, you know, gray hat idea, which was run a campaign to get followers an ad campaign, make it worldwide. And Facebook will then stick your ads into these bizarre countries where what people do is click to follow businesses. <laughs> so I actually have 14 or 1500 people that follow my business that I got from Facebook for, I don't know, $15. And <laughs> You know, and there's no engagement, but unlike Instagram, you know, I didn't have to worry about the buying the f followers because one, actually, I'm not buying the followers. I did it through a legitimate way through Facebook. I mean, this is Facebook's own stuff. I didn't, you know, bring some third party in to bring fake accounts. You know, I, apparently these aren't fake accounts. I mean, this is what Facebook marketed to, um, you know, to bring them in because I don't have to worry about the algorithm sending my content out to people that aren't going to interact with it and see because nobody's going to see it anyway. They've killed it. Now, if Facebook ever opened back up their algorithm, um, my account would be in a pretty tough spot. I'd probably have to, uh, you know, cancel all of these followers and start from scratch. And But uh, that's fine. I'll, I'll deal with that if it comes. It puts me in no worse spot than I had been. Um, but it does go to show, you know, to your point that you do have to worry about the whims of the algorithm and you have to tailor your approach for the platform. Because, you know, the platforms are, are very different. You know, Instagram is looking, especially now for videos, and they're looking for a lot of impersonal videos. Um, YouTube is looking for a lot more uh, uh, sculpted content, a lot more professional content. Um, you know, I mean, God, uh, Instagram wants video vertical. YouTube wants it horizontal, right? I mean, there's there are these fundamental differences that, you know, when you're not playing to your uh, particular platform, you know, you're, you're not going to have success across across the range. Well said. Is there anything else that you think we should talk about, be it, you know, about social media or really anything else? Gosh, just that... Uh, I, one of the things I was really late to in my entrepreneurial world was not thinking I was kind of too smart for the group. Um, and, you know, I don't want to listen to other dealers because they don't know what they're doing. I know what I'm doing. And in some respects, it's true, right? I, you know, in some respects, they can't follow where you want to go. Mm -hmm. um, but in many respects, they know a lot more than you. And to not take some of that advice and then give back uh, was a real mistake. And so, um, in the past year or so, I've joined a lot of dealer communities, um, you know, where, you know, you just hear the same old tropes and, you know, you kind of hold your ears and you're like, yeah, this is what I didn't want. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and, and so in some cases you're validated, but in other cases, you know, your eyes are really opened and the connections that you make um, and, and all of that. Cause I know that, that probably most people listening to this will be, you know, in the tech world and some may be in a more traditional space trying to push tech. And what I would, I would really uh, encourage people don't askew, you know, your, your more brick and mortar and traditional business people, because they really have a lot to say too. Um, and, and the connections that you make where you can help bring them up and they can help bring you up uh, are, are really invaluable. And it's something I wish I would have done a long time ago. I think that's a, as, as good of a note as any to end this conversation on. Before we hop off, is there any um, anything you want to plug? Where can people find you, connect with you? ask you uh, stupid questions about IP law or which car to buy. Well, that's the whole reason we're here, right? Yeah. Just for, for, for plugging. Yeah, yeah so that's right. That's miss, right. I'm not going to miss this opportunity. Uh, <laughs> so on, on all social media for the uh, business, it is by Crosscut. So on Instagram, by Crosscut. Facebook, by Crosscut. Don't follow us on there because you won't see anything. Uh, <laughs> but definitely give us a follow on Facebook. Uh, on YouTube. So on YouTube, we have, uh, we have a bunch of test drive videos of our cars um, that 7,000 people have found interesting. Uh, but uh, I'll be posting uh, more of our, you know, long form storytelling content soon. I may make another channel, but you'll learn it through there. And then on the web by crosscut.com, you can see our custom website that I built every line of code that John helped me design. Um, so that was our collaboration coming together. So if you're curious, um, you know, what kind of stuff does John make? Uh, how do we implement it? Uh, go take a look there because uh, you know, that's probably one that we've given uh, a ton of time to anyway. Uh, so check that out. And then for my personal branding, uh, on Twitter, it is La Jolla, L-A-W-J-O-L-L-A. -L -L -A. I made that uh, handle in a uh, fit of modesty. <laughs> I was living in La Jolla, California and thought I was in law and I'm super cool. And so I am La Jolla. There you go. Oh, well, I, I guess it's creative, sort of. Uh, yeah, yeah. In, in its own way. Yeah. In, a, in its own sad, <laughs> pathetic way. Right. <laughs> All right, Dennis, it's been an absolute pleasure. Um, I hope we can have one of those these conversations again soon. I'm, I'm sure people will uh, would love to have you back on and, and to hear more about what you've got to say about, you know, law or, or the car business or social media. Awesome, John. Well, I sure appreciate it. It's been great working with you. Um, you know, hopefully, uh, you know, I, I, I was really happy I got in with you um, before you had this giant agency with a million clients. And I never could afford you. So um, <laughs> I'm glad I got in on the ground level and uh, got this podcast kicked off. Well, hey, sometimes you catch a lucky break. That's right. All right. Take care. Thanks. Thanks.